Well, here I am once again at Conrad Weiser with another video at Fast Play War Games and Bill Molino. And here we have Don Kramer to talk about the French Indian War from the French side. So take it away, Don. You know, the French army in the 18th century, the French Empire rather, in the 18th century, really looked at what we would now call the United States as a territory that was rich in resources. And the French were interested in one resource in particular, and that was pelts, animal pelts, and specifically beaver pelts. The beaver pelt trade served the fashion industry in France and was immensely important. And so France's interest in what we would call New France was really patterned on their interest in what the fur trade offered. And so everything that France did and kind of the way they approached coming into what we would now call the United States and Canada and their whole pattern of migration was all focused on getting to those pelts and creating a, uh, a method for getting that stuff from uh, the American, uh, from the colonies and from that area back over to Europe and getting resources from Europe over to be able to get those pelts. And so what we have is, you know, a lot of locals who began uh, this, the, the trade with the indigenous peoples of the area. Eventually, the French sent uh, armed troops in to help provide secure uh, areas of settlement and civilization. But the whole emphasis was built on this fur trade. And ultimately, as those resources ran out in the, in the Lake Champlain area and in the Hudson Bay area, they would continue moving further south through New York into Pennsylvania down into the Ohio River Valley to the, the forks of Monongahela, what we would call present day Pittsburgh. And ultimately that's where they came into direct conflict with the interests of the British Empire, which had the 13 colonies and they were trying to expand westward for the sake of settlement. And it was because of this, this ultimate fight over territory in Western Pennsylvania that really inspired the entirety of the French and Indian War. And from this you know, French interest, and as of course we know that ultimately the French would lose the French and Indian War, and when they lost the French and Indian War, it's very telling that the British Empire gave the French the opportunity to either keep New France or keep the Caribbean. And the French trade in the Caribbean was built on spices. And it's very telling to note that the French, rather than taking America and the beaver trade, stuck with the spice trade and kept the Caribbean and instead ceded over all the lands in what was then New France to the British Empire, which in turn, uh, now that they had complete control of the colonies and what we would now call America, the British Empire would go on to tax the colonists uh, to help pay for the British support of that French and Indian War, which then would turn around and lead to the War of American Revolution. Well, um, I guess I'm going to ask you two questions for my viewers. They're going to want to know, one, well, why do we have a white flag flying behind you as the French? Because I'm going to have to answer a ton of YouTube questions about that. Sure. Could you just hit that for me so sure, I don't have to absolutely. deal with it? Absolutely. Our understanding of the white flag being a flag of surrender is a, is a more modern notion. Um, it's always important when you're studying history to not to be careful not to push back into history things that may not have been there at that time. And in the 18th century, the white flag was not actually a flag of surrender. It was the flag of the uh, of the French Empire, the French the, the French Kingdom, and it was a sign of the purity of the French King. Um, that white that white banner of purity, actually the banner of truce or the banner of parley, which was, which was a temporary truce in order to negotiate terms, that actually was conducted under a solid red flag in this period, not a white flag. All right, and I guess my final question is, uh, what's the gold thing around your chest that uh, yes. you have? This gold piece is called a gorget, and in the 18th century, the gorget in the British and French armies was the mark of an officer. Uh, I am actually the officer of my company, and this would have signified that. It is actually one of the last remnants of uh, ancient medieval armor. When uh, 
you know, those of high status would wear armor covering their whole body because they could afford it. Well, I, as a sign of my status as an officer, still wear this small metal ornamentation as a sign of my office. All right. Well, I'm going to pause the video here and we'll uh, uh, thank you, Don. We'll bring in uh, Captain Dave Bybee next and we'll uh, do an introduction for him. And now we have Dave Bybee, and uh, thank you, Dave, for taking a few minutes to be on my YouTube channel, and I'm going to just say, take it away. All right, I'm dressed as a member of the Company Franche de la Marine du Contra Corps. Um, we were an independent company of Marines that garrisoned Fort Duquesne during the French and Indian War. Um, my uniform difference differs from his slightly. We're both carrying... Um, I'm carrying a, um, uh, a, gargu a gargousier or belly box, and he's carrying a jaburn. Um, I'm going to assume... And what's in these things? They are carrying our, our cartridges. Okay. Um, Pre-prepared <laughs> rounds. The wall would be on the bottom of the cartridge, and then the rest of the, the powder is on top of it. And... We'd bite them off, pour some in the pan, close our pan, turn our gun around, dump the rest down the barrel, pull our ramrod, and ram to seat the, the charge. Okay. Um, I'm ass assuming that he has the 30 round Giburn. There's also another one called the Great Giburn, which is a 60 round box. Um, he has a bayonet which goes on top of your gun and used for lunging at your opposing force. Um, Too bad this is 3D. <laughs> um, I have a, a hunting pouch where I carry extra cartridges, um, extra balls, um, flints, my uh, tools for servicing the gun. Um, the gun itself is a 1728 um, French infantry musket called the Saint Etienne. Um, a little different from a Charleville, where the strap on a Charleville would be underneath on the 1728. It's it's uh, carried from the side. Um, there's not as much drop in the stock on the Charleville as there is on the um, Saint Etienne. Um, our uniforms differ a little bit. He's wearing a capote um, where I have my waistcoat and my um, juice decor. So uh, did the French army stay warm? I mean, you're based in, in Canada, New France. Uh, how were you, were you, all this wool, is it helping to keep you guys warm today? We have snow here. Yeah, um, wool's a natural fiber, so it will keep you cold in the in the summer, and also keep you warm in the winter. Uh, um, I'm wearing a tricorn, where he's wearing a toque. Um, covers your head a little better, covers your ears, help you keep help keep you warm. Very good. Well. Um, to the YouTube people out there, I'd like to say both of these gentlemen are fantastic historians and I'm proud to have them be my friends. They are also in my wedding and Don, he actually married my wife Lisa and I and was phenomenal. And Dave, he helped keep things uh, going at the wedding with everyone survived without uh, any issues. So from Conrad Weiser, I thank both Dave Bybee and Don Kramer for doing the video with me. And stay safe, be kind, and be courteous.